I think the first game I ever played that well and truly kicked my ass was Devil May Cry 3. The first several missions of that game were harder than nearly anything else I'd experienced in a game to that point in my life, but I managed to pull through it. However, upon reaching Virgil, I was stopped dead in my tracks. He was hard, impossibly hard, or so I thought at the time. In attempt after attempt, I would run up that staircase eager for one more shot, and there at the top I proceeded to die again and again and again. Over the course of this ordeal, I began to feel myself become bitter and resentful and more than a little insecure about my own skill. Who is this guy? Does he not know who I am? I'm Dante! I'm the coolest person on the planet! Like two hours ago I killed a room full of demons using a set of pool balls! How dare this cocky piece of trash pretend to be better than me! I swear, I don't care if I'm good enough or not, I'm going to crush this guy! It was around the time I thought that, that I realized something. This is what Dante's feeling down to the letter. In that moment, I was more in tune with Dante as a character than I ever had been before, a feeling that would persist over the course of the game. And that would not have happened if Virgil hadn't been able to repeatedly destroy me. Or, to put it another way, the difficulty was able to convey Dante and Virgil's rivalry to me better than any amount of dialogue could. And DMC3 isn't the only game to do this. In the hands of a skilled designer, difficulty applied with a purpose can serve as one of the strongest ways to craft a narrative. Perhaps the most legendary example of this application is Dark Souls. Also, I know about 90% of you thought of it immediately the second you saw the title of this video, so let's just get it out of the way right now. Souls director Hidetaka Miyazaki has stated repeatedly in interviews that he doesn't make his games hard for hard sake. He has no interest in crafting a game that exists purely for masochists to enjoy. Quite the contrary, actually. He wants you to feel powerful and accomplished. There's admittedly a number of ways he could have gone about doing this, but the method he's chosen is through staunch adversity. By making every inch of progress hard won, it makes each inch feel that much more rewarding. If you've played Dark Souls, you most likely have a similar relationship with at least one boss, and that boss could have been any boss in the game, but it was Ornstein and Smoke. More than that, though, the difficulty well and truly sets the tone of the game. Games that take place in Dying World are a dime a dozen. However, Dark Souls is one of the small handful that actually feel like the world is on its last leg. This is a world more than nearly any other that does not want you here. It wants you out, and it will do whatever it has to to make that happen. This results in a rich atmosphere that brings massive weight to every bit of new lore you uncover explaining why this world is like this. However, this is not a video about Dark Souls, and while using difficulty to empower, reward, and motivate a player is a great tool, it's been a well-known trick since the early days of gaming, and was debatably mastered as early as the original Castlevania, and its application and narrative has been well documented in games like Mega Man X. But what if a game decided to use difficulty in almost the exact opposite way? As a means to demean, punish, and discourage for the purposes of the narrative. Well, then we would have... Look, if you're one of the five remaining people who have neither played Undertale nor had the ever-loving bejesus spoiled out of it for you, then click here to skip over this part to go to the next. Everyone good? Alright. Okay. So. Sans. Hold on one second, let me put on the required music. There we go. His fight is hard, to say the least. Frankly, his fight is unfair. There are plenty of moments in it that are cheap and completely unpredictable. You are almost ensured to die at least once, more than likely 50 times, to something that you could not have reasonably expected to know how to respond to as quickly as the game would like, be that the intro, the time skips, or his attempt to spare you. This fight is one of the most frustrating fights in all of gaming, and that is by design. The difficulty here is used as an attempt to literally make you give up. You are not supposed to beat the Sans fight. He exists as a roadblock. You are meant to give up and start the whole game again. The point of this fight isn't to be fun or rewarding or even to provide a challenge. Even if you win the fight, it doesn't feel rewarding. There's no big, I did it, climax. You stab a man in his sleep before he wanders off while hallucinating that he's seen his brother who you also killed. It's meant to be miserable. It's no coincidence that Sans is the only character who is aware of how many times you died and makes fun of you for it with unique lines of dialogue going all the way up to 12 deaths. 
This fight is Toby Fox telling the player in no uncertain terms, you have played the game wrong, you have screwed up, and you need to go try again. I promise you, you'll have more fun if you do. Sans literally tells you as much if you attempt to spare him. Toby Fox doesn't want to deny a player their right to play the game the way they see fit, but he'll be damned if he doesn't try and steer you onto the path that he wants you to take. And difficulty, paired with a fair amount of guilt and shame, is how he sees fit to do it. Now let's switch the music back to something a little more low-key, shall we? There we go. There is one more usage I would like to talk about, and for that we're going to have to look at a somewhat forgotten moment of one of the most well-known games ever. Call of Duty 2. Specifically what is probably the game's hardest level, the Battle on Hill 400. Now, Noah Codwell Gervais has a fantastic look back at the entire Call of Duty franchise that includes a brilliant dissection for what this level translates into thematically that I'll link in the description. The short version of it though is, during Hill 400, you will die. A lot. You will die randomly, you will die from bad luck, you will die because you just happen to be in the exact wrong place at the exact wrong time. Some level of twitch aiming skills and an edge of tomorrow-like understanding of the battle itself may decrease the chances of these things happening, but realistically, especially on higher difficulties, these deaths are essentially unavoidable. Unless you are incredibly experienced in this game, success on this level is nearly random. This is the reality of the post-automatic weapon and air raid warfare world we live in. Of modern warfare, if you'll forgive the reference. A lot of well-deserved love has been heaped over the years onto Call of Duty 4's Aftermath level as Pop Gaming's definitive anti-war set piece. And that might be true, but the virtual struggles I experienced on Hill 400 have completely killed whatever latent masculine desire I may have had to ever find myself or anyone else holding a gun and wearing a uniform, for any reason other than one of absolute necessity. And if that's not symptomatic of a powerful anti-war statement, I don't know what is. And it is a statement that could not exist without the game's difficulty. More and more often, I've been seeing articles and blog posts talking about how difficult games exist solely to perpetuate gamer elitism. And while elitism in games is a legitimate problem that does need to be talked about, I would really like us to take a moment and realize that difficulty serves not only a gameplay purpose, but a narrative one as well. Challenge is one of the truly unique things games can offer, and as games keep showing us, there's still so much more to learn about how to apply the things that only games can do. And if there's anything I keep learning, it's that there's always a new way to apply even the most basic resource when you're making something. By keeping challenge in our game design arsenal, we give creators one more tool to make games stand out as the unique art form that they are, with narratives that no other art form could possibly hope to replicate. And I think that is worth all of the snap controllers we'll see along the way.